Welcome again to Object Oriented Programming. This is part 14. We're going to make a pressure cooker in this example. What? A pressure cooker? Yep, you got yourself a job. You're going to write the code for a new pressure cooker like you see there. So you're writing for Cuisinart and this is an example of an event driven process. The cooker just sits on the counter until somebody presses a button. Then it wakes up. The reality is that the machine never actually goes to sleep. It's been sitting there continuously doing an endless loop, querying the buttons to see if anybody pushed them. This is typical for event-driven software. In fact, every graphical user interface works this way. Something is always on even if the, the device appears to be off. Every computerized TV, microwave, bread maker, stove, dishwasher, etc. Any gizmo that sleeps, quote unquote, is actually consuming electricity and running an endless loop. So how do we attack this pressure cooker problem? Well you work from the most vague to the most detailed. This is the way that we do object-oriented design and object-oriented programming. So let's look at the endless loop. The power comes on, we initialize some variables. Then we check the button. Hey, did any get pressed? No? Go back to the beginning of the loop. Yes, somebody pushed it? Well, start the method for that button. So maybe it's something like this. So there we have a object called pressure cookers. While true, which is always going to be true, so this is going to be endless. For a button in X buttons, if a button is pressed, run. Something like this is going to get you started, and this is essentially how all event-driven software operates. Your TV, even though it's quote unquote off, it's really sitting there waiting for the on command from your remote control or from, if it has a button on the side, from the button on the side. And all of your GUI driven software is doing the same thing. So let's work on the classes for this pressure cooker. Well, we know we're gonna need a pressure cookers class. I mean, they may wanna have different models, right? some gray, some black, some silver, whatever. We know that a class, or this class, is going to have a list of buttons, and those buttons are going to have to do something, so those buttons are actually going to be of a different class. Now, we talked about this before. This is what we call a container class, one class that holds other classes, like the horse hand that contain the classes of the horse feet. So they're gonna need an attribute to store their name, they're gonna need an attribute to know whether or not they were pressed, they're going to need a method called run, so maybe something like what you see on the screen. How about some subclasses? Well, each of the buttons are going to do different things and you may reuse those buttons for other cookers that they hire you to work on. So let's subclass the buttons according to the purpose. And so the method inheritance is what we're going to use here. I'm introducing a new function called super. Now the super function, and there is the link to the documentation, this allows a child class to directly call its parents method. So in this case, we're going to call the parent's initialization method. All of this is empty right now. We're just creating a structure. But the reason that we want to do this is to make sure that whatever gets initialized in the parent also gets initialized with us. Okay? Each button is also going to overload the run method of its parent because obviously each button is going to do something a little bit differently. So let's start with the menu button. The menu button is gonna cycle through all the cycles one at a time. 
low pressure, high pressure, browning, saute. Now the cycles belong to the cooker, not to the button. Keep that in mind. The time button is going to set the amount of cooking time for each cycle. Again, the cooking time belongs to the cooker. The button just sets it. And the start cancel button will either start the cooking or interrupt the cycle. And those are attributes of the cooker. Different cookers could have a different button set up. Maybe instead of having one start cancel button, it has a different button for start and a different button for cancel. Maybe instead of time, it has a button for minutes and a button for seconds. The buttons have to access attributes on the cooker, but the button class is contained inside the cooker class. So how does it know where it lives? Well, the buttons need to know what cooker it belongs to. So the way we do this is the cooker sends self to the buttons. Remember that self is a link to myself. So when the cooker creates the buttons, it sends self as a parameter. The buttons take that parameter and they call it cooker and store it. So now they know where the cooker is. The button receives a pointer, a link, similar to the web. You don't actually have eBay on your computer, but you know that eBay.com links you there, takes you there. Same deal. The parameter cooker is receiving self from the class ABC Pressure Cookers, and so that parameter is a pointer to ABC Pressure Cookers. Hope that makes sense. This is different than inheritance or lineage. The buttons do not inherit from the cookers. They're different classes. Cooker is not the super parentheses of the buttons. The cooker is a class that contains the buttons. It's a container class similar to horse hand way back on slide 59. And if you click on slide 59, it'll take you there. Here you have another subclass. Now we should subclass pressure cookers. Why? Because maybe we have different pressure cookers. Maybe there's an economy line, maybe there's a luxury line, and maybe each line has different cycles or a different number of buttons. This is typical in real world factories and this is typical in object oriented design. So now our methods look like what you see here. We have subclassed pressure cookers and made ABC pressure cookers because this one happens to be model ABC123. Now we're going to continue to work from most vague, least detailed to the most detailed. As you work, you'll figure out which methods and which attributes you're going to need. Now let's remember the guidelines that we talked about before and those links are all active in case you don't remember. But we talked about don't repeat yourself. So don't write the same line of code twice. We talked about separation of concerns that each method should do one thing for a different user, the marketing guys, the sales guys, the engineer guys. We talked about the single responsibility principle. Each method should be short, do one thing and do one thing well. We talked about the easier to ask forgiveness than permission principle. In other words, you assume that the input is correct and you only take action when the input is not. Getting inputs from sensors we talked about. We're going to use the pass keyword, which absolutely does nothing. It just acts like a placeholder while you develop a structure. And structure is very important for the model view controller principle that we introduced back in slide 121. And we're going to talk about a lot more when we get into GUIs. So far for the buttons, we know that they are receiving a pointer to the cooker when they are being instantiated. We know that the cooker buttons store a pointer 
in an attribute that they call self cooker. And the subclasses run the supers init method. This is usually a good practice when you overload any method to run the supers method either at the end or at the beginning of the child method. It depends on your code. And let's try to put this pressure cooker code together, but just to this level. Don't figure out how the buttons work and everything. I just want you to put the structure together. And again, the answer is in the shared folder. And uh, I hope this is a, a challenge for you. You get this done and you're doing a whole lot of the most important object-oriented programming concepts. So um, good luck and uh, enjoy yourself. And I'll see you in number 15.